old. I sound like a teenage boy going through a voice change. And Stevie Nicks together. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed it in Lighting the Void the other night. <laughs> oh, man. It's, I think it's allergies or something in bad cheer. Welcome to Nox Mente. Tonight's guest is John E. L. Tenney. John is one of the most recognized investigators of paranormal occult phenomena in America. Due to his extended time involved in paranormal research, he has appeared on camera and consulted for numerous companies, including Discovery, History Channel, A&E, Fox, Sci-Fi, and uh, the New York Times, NBC, ABC, and CBS. His writings, which span the fields of ufology, hauntings, and conspiracy theories have been printed in magazines and newspapers worldwide, and he has lectured to numerous public and private schools, universities, organizations, and clubs. It is estimated that over the past 28 years, more than 75,000 people have attended one of Mr. Tenney's signature quote-unquote weird lecture. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. Yeah, it's a it's a great pleasure. Again, I went I looked at all your credentials because sometimes I'm not fully familiar with the depth of everyone's work that Jerry books on, and I was in awe. I had I was aware of you know I'd say fifty percent, but the rest just made me feel uh, even more in awe. And then tonight, of course, we find out we have a, a mutual friend in honor. So. Hail to the synchronistic universe. Absolutely. <laughs> it's part of the course on the show. It's awesome. And and as I said to you privately, you come out of the, the big D Detroit people. You gotta love that. Well, thank you very much. I actually it's funny because it's it's nice to hear uh, that people think that I've done stuff because I was always afraid that for the first few years that I was involved with any kind of media, television or radio. Uh, I actually would make networks and different magazines and stuff sign non-disclosure agreements with me so that they wouldn't mention my name because I never knew how the project was going to come out. <laughs> I, I like to do that anyway, just in general. But yeah. That's, that's me. There were just so many times I would work on a project and then it would come out and I would see it, you know, whether it be on... Unsolved Mysteries or Sightings or one of those shows in the 90s. And I'd be like, oh, I don't want my name attached to that at all. That's, that is interesting. That's, uh, I, although I'm one to speak as well, because I'm, I'm all over in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> just, I just have a chameleon-like nature mm -hmm. and have got involved in a lot of different artistic projects let's see <laughs> anyway so let's let's dive into Noxmente. uh so the usual let's get started with kind of your early life john and what what as far back as you can remember way back in there and even if it's uh, a mix of memories that are aren't clear what what sticks out? What is still there in the deep down basement? That, yeah, um, there's a lot still left. Uh, I don't know why. And obviously, a lot of it is me remembering when I remembered it. But when I go for a really visceral, my very first uh, image that I have is my father's face in front of me, kind of screaming at me. Uh, not in an angry fashion, but just very excited. This is kind of my very first uh, memory that I have. And I never knew what that was until I started, this is probably 20 years ago, I started backing up how old I might have been. And I started asking my father about it. And, and the only thing that he could come up with was one time, um, I was almost three, when Nixon resigned. 
And he said that he had gotten in front of me and, and screamed in my face that I should remember what's happening because it's important. And it was when Nixon was on television resigning. And I think that's what that memory is of. Wow. That's that's pretty awesome. This is that's exactly how I honed in on on dating. My early stuff was talking to my mom about, you know, certain things I could pull out and she could only date them by stuff like that. That's that's good. Three years old is so young. But it's but it's, you know, again, it's just a flash of my father's face and him being excited. So, I mean, I it could be anything. The uh, the memory from youth that I constantly consider uh, even all these years later and and think about it all the time is I have a very visceral visceral memory of being at my grandfather's house when I'm about five and running, he had a wheat field next to his cabin in Northern Michigan. And I was running full speed. And I remember the wheat like kind of whipping against my chest. And at a certain point, I remember the wheat uh, brushing and skimming ag- against the, the, the front of my face, the top of my chest and my knees as if I was flying. And that's that memory that uh, for some reason I had stopped running and I had started floating above the wheat. Oh, that's a very beautiful image. Did you, so with that, what was your relationship with nature early on? Uh, always very, uh, as, a, as a kid, I am being, who was sent outside a lot. Uh, I always climbed trees. I loved uh, getting up as high as I could in the trees. I loved collecting rocks. And for my entire life, uh, all the way back into those forgotten recesses of my childhood, I've always talked to the wind. Uh, I confront it as a friend. I greet it when it blows on my face. Uh, I listen to it as it moves the inner hairs in my ears as if those the, that wind is words. And I've always done that. So I've always seemed to have been a friend of nature. Are you an air sign? I am a Virgo. What's your rising, though? That could be. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Virgo Leo. Oh, so Leo moon or Leo rising? Uh, Leo rising. Okay, so no air there. <laughs> that was a good good call, though, Jer. That what do you think connected you so deeply with the wind? I mean, it's this very shamanic, magical. I know that you, like me, didn't uh, had the pleasure of not having religion thrown down. You know, grew up in an open household. Yeah, I I don't know. There was something that always fascinated about me about the wind. Uh, even back again, I have a lot of childhood memories. I used to think it was so funny that something invisible could push me down and move things around. And it was so powerful, and yet it was so intangible. I, I was just always fascinated with it and always thought it was something that should be respected. Indeed. And it, it, it's, it's just, I mean, it's nice that that was so instinctual with you. Do you? Where are you with that now? Do you see wind as an elemental being? Uh, I see it as a friend. There was a few years ago, um, probably four years ago, I was at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado doing an event. And I was walking. There's a, the Stanley is up on a big hill. And I'd walk down into the city uh, by myself. And as I was walking up the hill, this huge gust of wind blew through the mountains and knocked me down, literally knocked me down. It was so strong. And I fell on my back and I was really angry for about two seconds. And then all of my life memories of the wind, like all of a sudden I started laughing and I was laying there on my back as it kept blowing. And I just started saying like, hello, hello, I'm sorry. I haven't talked to you in so long. I get it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I started laughing and then stood up and it just kept blowing me as I started meandering through the mountains and around the Stanley Hotel. So I just see it more as a friend, not even as a, a any kind of archetype of of a god or or a being. It's just something that's always been around me. That actually gives me these uh, the good these good goosebumps. Uh, I I do too. I actually I actually talk to it still daily, especially when I I'm lighting incense and I I ask 
you know, the power, the being of the wind to carry into the wind and all that. That's, that's really, that's I, awesome. I, I have this thing which uh, has gone on for years and years, which uh, I don't, I don't even know how I process it in my mind too, because I do this same thing when I, I light, I burn a lot of incense and um, I actually smoke too. So even sometimes when I'm watching how the wind will move my, the cigarette smoke around when I exhale, but whenever I hear the term, like on the weather, when I hear the term high wind, uh, in my mind, it's always H I like hello wind yes. instead of <laughs> high wind. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that just underlines all of reality, our, our absolute perception and perspective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that shows over people. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, so getting back to your your young your young in days, did you, you know, like what kind of pop culture stuff inspired you or sticks out? Cartoons, you know, comic books, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was a comic book kid. I collected comic books. Um, We had, you know, like I said, we would go on these trips up to northern Michigan, and so I would read constantly. And a lot of the time, the only thing you could find that was kid reading friendly at at gas stations back in the 70s were comic books. So I just started reading comic books. And by the time I was 10 or 11, you know, I had a few thousand. And by that time, I was already playing. I, I had started to play Dungeons and Dragons. And the comic books I were reading led me to, you know, the Saturday and, and Friday night movies when they would show horror films and science fiction films. So when it came to pop cultures, I was always into haunted houses, big monsters, and people who looked normal but had superhumans inside them. That... Uh... I, I write stuff down so that I can refer to it later. Uh, bit, haunted houses and big monsters, big things that I love too. It, what about sci-fi stuff? So, because I think of big monsters and haunted houses more in like folk horror and horror. Yeah, uh, I loved Flash Gordon as a kid and Buck Rogers. I used to read the Alex Raymond novels in school when we would have those book sales. There would always be Alex Raymond, Flash Gordon books. Uh, and those were always very science fictiony, but always had big monsters, and of course had the hero that looked human, but uh, mm-hmm. had seemed to have something more inside of them. And that led to Star Trek and Star Wars. I was, you know, the perfect age for Star Wars. I was uh, seven when it came out, so you know that was prime for me. And then uh, by the time you know Return of the Jedi came out, I had already kind of aged out of it and was moving into writing punk rock songs with my friends. Yeah, rock on. (laughs) (laughs) We're in, this is just uh, silly of me to ask, but did you spend time up in the UP? No, uh, the area where my parents and my grandparents uh, kind of came out of is in Alpena. So the lower peninsula, but the northern half, uh, kind of if your hand is the shape of Michigan, the map of Michigan, up near the top of your index finger. So that's still big nature up there. Yeah, a lot. And my family, between my family and all of the people in it and the extended family, there were always hundreds of acres of forest and swamp to wander around in. And you never really had any fear of getting lost because, you know, the tracts of land are divided up into these giant mile squares. And so, you know, my uncle would live on one side. My grandfather lived on the west side. We lived on the north side and another cousin would live. So you could walk and walk and walk and eventually you just get to someone's house. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you, in all your time there, I think I heard recently, I try to check out what's going on in people's worlds before they come here. I think I heard you mention that you have never had a Bigfoot experience. Uh, I haven't. I've never seen Bigfoot. I've obviously uh, been in the forest when I thought something else was there. I think we've all been in the forest when, uh, well, most of us have been in the forest when we hoped something was out there that might be Bigfoot. But I've investigated Bigfoot. I've taken people on Bigfoot hunts, but I've never encountered one-on-one anything like that. What about sounds, knocks, howls? Oh, for sure. Uh, Years ago, one of the things that I started doing, which actually increased the amount of times I had experiences with something out there, 
was I had talked to a friend of mine who was going to school for primatology. And she was saying, you know, if you want to, if, if Bigfoot is a primate, if it's a relic hominid or a primate, instead of knocking on wood, and instead of, um, you know, yelping out into the woods, I would pick up big branches and thrash the ground because primates will make a kind of nest. And so they make a thrashing sound and the other primates in the area hear that and recognize, oh, that primate feels safe enough to sleep. I should thrash the ground too. And so now when I go out into the forest, one of the things I'll do is I'll find a big branch with a lot of leaves on it, thrash the ground and then just sit and listen, thrash the ground and sit and listen. And a, a lot of times you hear the thrashing back. But if, if Bigfoot's interdimensional and not primate, that could be like some kind of mating call. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people where my world is big enough for relic hominids and interdimensional Bigfoot and robotic Bigfoot and <laughs> archetype Bigfoot. I think that I think that the world is is big enough and weird enough to have oh, yeah. all of those things going. I'm on. right there with you. Yeah, we are. We're definitely that open here in Noxmente. It's all on the table. I think it's really funny when I do lectures and there are so many people, and this still happens to this day, where I'll start talking about the fact that, you know, if Bigfoot is like humans, um, then they might, you know, only couple once and have a single child. And then people will stop me and say, wait, there's more than one Bigfoot? And I'll, I'll, I'll say, yeah. Like, they don't even realize that. They think that everybody has been talking about the same Bigfoot, only one singular Bigfoot across the world for the past 50 years. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's it's funny. Perception, people's perception of all that. Well, I had no perception. I didn't even think it was serious. And in the UP, at least what I was exposed to, they called it the ho-dunk for some reason. Mm -hmm. Is that where you had your thing? In Me? the UP? Or was it in Washington? No, yeah, I had a Bigfoot experience in Washington okay. up on remote Mount Hood, and I will never, I don't want to be anywhere near them again. So <laughs> that was very <laughs> scary. I'm a complete believer now. That's definitely on the table. You didn't thrash right. No, nope. I will nope. tell you, uh, no Bigfoot experiences, and people who know me and have been to my lectures know that. Uh, a few years ago, I did see what I... I call an elf, and that's only because the gentleman who introduced me to it called it an elf. Uh, but I don't think that the creature recognized itself as an elf. That's but interesting. I'm more interested in the gentleman who introduced you to it. <laughs> uh, former automotive worker. His wife had passed away. He was spending his kind of waning years uh, living by himself in Michigan's Thumb area mm -hmm. and backed up to a state forest and would go in around at night and sing uh, to his wife, you know, to her spirit mm -hmm. and to her mind, and had become friends with these creatures that live out there. Very cool. And so he had come to one of my lectures and, and just casually, very openly asked me, do you want to see an elf? And I implore people at my lectures, if anyone ever asks you to do something weird, and it seems pretty <laughs> safe, say yes. Yeah. So I said, so I said, yes. I, I love that perspective. The mm. thing, one, the one of the things though that having spent a lot of time in Upper Peninsula, I'm from the Midwest too, and uh, up and and having family in Iowa and Minnesota and Wisconsin, all that is I was around bears. I've been around a lot of black bears, yep. and so I know a bear. I've been real close to him. And so when I had my experience, like I, I know the difference, although the brain, my brain wanted to tell me it was a bear. And, uh, but now I don't, there, I have no desire to experience that level of terror again. It, it was not happy. It was very scary. I was not expecting it at all. Again, I, I, I didn't even believe in them. So I, it's not that I didn't believe in them. I just didn't give them any mind. You know, I didn't pay any attention to them. They were not on my radar. They were always just there, of course, through mysterious universe and all the stuff. The lore has always been around me, but I just, for whatever reason, didn't buy into it. And then I had my experience, and now I am very cautious about being, being really remote. Holy crap. I mean, my dogs, the person I was with, we all had the experience together. So. 
but that's another another show and i've talked about that a lot so back in back in the early the early way back days for you what was your experience with dreaming um i have always throughout my entire life uh probably and to this day so uh, i've always had very vivid and horrifying dreams um I used to wake up as a little kid and had to be, you know, kind of coaxed back to sleep. Uh, my parents went through the process at one point of throwing all my comic books away because they thought that was the problem. Um, and even to this day, twice, twice a month, maybe three times a month, I'll have sleep paralysis or night terrors. So dreams have always been a very ingrained part of my life for as long as I've been able to remember. And I'm an insomniac. I think that that plays a big part into why I don't sleep very much. So do you have any examples of, so the, of the early experiences where the dreams were? So do you, do you recall any dreams from that early experience, first of all? And if you do, could you give us some examples of the imagery? Sure. Um, one of them is me standing in a stairwell that branches off into other stairwells. This is a dream that I had as a little kid and was repeated many times throughout my childhood. Uh, a stairwell that has many stairwells attached to it. And I race to the top of one and the stairs uh, kind of fold in on themselves to become a slide. And I start sliding down this multitude of slides. They're all now interconnected. And I see at the bottom, uh, my father, and he's kind of standing there waiting to catch me. But I know that if I slide into him, I'm going to knock him down. And I can see behind him is um, kind of like a, uh, almost a, a kind of giant meat grinder. And so I'm screaming for him to get out of the way, and he doesn't because he wants to stop me from sliding into this meat grinder. And I do hit him, and he's pushed in, and I grab his hands to keep him from going fully in. But, but I can see that this machine has got his feet and is grinding up now his legs to his knees. And he's screaming for me to let him go, and I'm crying because I don't want to. And then finally, I I have to let him go, and that's when I wake up. Okay, you weren't kidding. That's that's like straight up horror imagery. That's pretty graphic. How old would you say you were? Uh, probably that that one probably started. God, I was probably right around nine or ten. And every time it ha recurred, did it? Did it always kind of follow the same yeah, path? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, that, that common dream world that you revisit, uh, that you recognize places in it, there would always be a point in the dream when I realize that the stairs are going to now turn into slides. And I'm always trying to figure a way out to grab onto something before they do that, but I never can. Were you ever able to at least wake up or did you have to ride that out no i have to ride it out every time Ooh we did and so at that point when the gruesome stuff happens is that what brings you back into consciousness yes yep absolutely wow so and, and so i guess in this time period too in this early time period just does, and if, unless it's the the same, has the architecture changed at all as far as the way you experience the dream? Uh, it, and I'm talking about like tactile stuff. Like, has anything changed? Is it black and white? Was it ever black and white? You know, that, touch, feel, sight, all that stuff. That has always remained the same. Like I said, the the repeating and reoccurring dreams that I've had throughout my life have always stayed exactly as they've been, except for a slight building of awareness each time it occurs, that maybe a little fraction of a second before the last time I remembered that was going to happen, I remembered it a little bit earlier this time. Um, but the, the, the situation is almost always exactly the same as far as I can tell. It's always color, um, full sound, and very, very, I mean, there's a lot of touch and feel. And, and tactile sensation. 
So with this dream in particular, what do you, so when you, so when the reoccurrence stopped, when it finally stopped, was there something that signified that? Did you, were you able to unlock whatever mechanism was causing this reoccurrence? Uh, anything you can put your finger on? I mean, as uh, the work I've done on myself over the years, just trying to figure out who I am and why I think the way I think, uh, I can back up that dream stopping being so common in my life with the with my dad quitting drinking because my dad was an alcoholic as I grew up. Um, and when he quit drinking is when the, that dream started to subside. Okay, well, that's significant. What about, so, and then just with the mechanics of dreams, and this is throughout the period, you know, the totality of your life so far, are you a flyer? Do you fly? Uh, I don't, actually. Um, strangely enough, that slide that the stairs turn into has an analog in other parts of my dreams where if I feel like I'm falling or if I'm airborne, this kind of um, animated uh, living slide shows up and gets underneath me and it's very fun and I laugh the entire time and it spins me around and then gently sets me down on the ground. Ooh, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> it's <was laughs> weird. I love that. Is does it feel like it's uh it's driving does it feel like it has its own sentience or I don't know, consciousness? Or is it, do you think it's part of you? Uh, it absolutely has a personality. Um, if I fall off of a building, like I said, even if I just uh, trip over something in a dream, like it pops in almost like a, a hilarious cartoon character. It almost pops in like, hello, and then it'll be there and then make take me on this really quick ride. And I and the slide laugh together as I'm kind of traversing it. And then as soon as I'm feet on the ground, it pops back away. Oh man, that's awesome. It's reminding me of Lidsville. <laughs> <laughs> Which I loved so much when I was little. You know, so HR Puff and stuff. That would explain the, the slee stacks in my dreams. <laughs> uh, is this the same for you, Jerry? I always dream about whatever show I watched. So I'm always put into that scenario. Yes. Yeah. It's bad when I binge watch things because every night it's the same. It's a new scenario in this, with the same characters. Interesting. It, interesting, but it, there's a, it makes a lot of sense, too. I mean, because it's, you know, it's all going through the filter, the brain filter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the sleep paralysis as a young kid, also, I guess I back up a little, did you have... So besides this, this kind of nightmarish dream stuff, did you have fears in the outer world, like something under the bed, something in the woods, fear of the dark, that kind of stuff? I had a fear of things under the bed. Uh, I did hide under my blankets. And, and I'll tell you that, uh, so one of the stories that I tell at my lectures, because it's so strange to have a kind of new story about something so old, but when I get anxious, I have this little tune that I'll hum or whistle, and it's just something that I do out of anxiety. So the tune is kind of like do 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 do. It's just this thing that it's it's almost like a mantra that will go through my head when I'm anxious. And about four or five years ago, I was sitting with my mother, and. Uh, there was a difficult situation going on in my family, and I did it out loud. I, I kind of did what I just did there. I said, Dude, I just was sitting at the table and went, do, 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 And my mom looked at me and she goes, oh, she goes, that, that silly song from when you were a little boy. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she goes, you always used to sing that in bed late at night. And I said, did I hum it like that? Is it, the, is it still the same? And she said, no, 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 that used to sing the lyrics. And I said, well, I, it doesn't have any lyrics. It's just a tune. And she said, no, no, it has lyrics. And then she, she told me the lyrics, which are, close your eyes and cover your face. There's little men from outer space touching your face, touching your face. 
Holy wow. <laughs> John. So when, when you got this feedback from your mother, what was your, what was oh, your I, response? I, I mean, I, how do you process that? I mean, I freaked out. Like now that I've done these lectures and been in this world for 30 years, immersed in this stuff. And then my mother tells me something that I never knew about myself from my childhood that relates to, you know, screen memories and, and, uh, things that might have happened that I'm not too well aware of. I mean, it just blew my mind and, and really made me crazy for about a year. Uh, it's phenomenal. And I don't think I've heard anything quite like it. It's, it's really, it's phenomenal. It's, it's weird. It plays into time loops in my mind when I hear that. And, you know, I could just probably go all over with it. And I'm sure you have. Uh, the thing that's really odd to me is that I, had no recollection that there were words to that song. And my mom somehow does. And this was actually at the beginning, my mom has Alzheimer's. And so this was actually at the beginning when it was starting to onset, she was losing a lot. And so for her to be able to pull this thing from the past um, inside of her, that was about me that I had forgotten, I, I really found kind of thunder striking. It's like a little gift from the universe, really. To, to come and with everything you just said, you know, you've been immersed in this world for a long time. This predates all that. It, it's super significant. Uh, I mean, it's, I got goosebumps from that. <laughs> <laughs> so did I when I first heard it. Wow, that is great. And so back in this period, oh man, I, I want to tangent off of that, but I'll wait. Uh, so back in this earlier period, and so let's just focus in into maybe just the early, the first half of your life now with, let's talk about sleep paralysis. Sure. Um, so from those early days to, I mean, I, I suppose we could even stretch it up until modern day, but it seems like the early days, when we look at perspective from the early days, talking about different phenomena it opens up it, it you know it opens up a new layer of uh inquiry that we can move into with your modern life however you want to uh fill us in on sleep paralysis yeah um you know it's interesting obviously because sleep paralysis is kind of widely recognized and understood more than it was in the 70s you know in the 70s it was just night terrors and i would try and tell people Oh, you know, I had this nightmare where I was awake and I couldn't move and people just called it a nightmare or a night terror. Like, I don't think I had ever heard sleep paralysis probably until the mid or late eighties. Um, and yet again, in a kind of synchronistic, uh, pattern or a little nudge from the universe, when I used to go down to the Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, my, one of my favorite paintings that I would look at is the nightmare which is, you know, the little hobgoblin sitting on top of a woman who's passed out on a bed with the kind of demonic horse peeking through the curtains, which most people say is a representation of sleep paralysis. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's tied right in with Mary Shelley. And I mean, it's that painting in and of itself has such great, a great history. Uh, that's So do you, so this is, this is you now. Do, what do you think about night terrors is do you what are your thoughts on it how how so the way you've experienced them through your life and all of this uh journey you've been on through the paranormal and the weird and all that what have you come to rest on as far as ideas about sleep paralysis like what's the evolution of sleep paralysis in your mind yeah, so I mean, obviously, as a child, it was just a frightening experience. And now it's this fascination with when it's occurring in, in the early moments, when it first starts to happen, and there's that kind of stark terror that it's happening. Now, that seems to very quickly go away, while I begin to try and understand it in the moment 
So instead, where before I would try and struggle to force myself awake or scream or move uh, or try to stop whatever that force that seems to be in the room with me is, now it's very exploratory where I don't struggle and scream, where I'm just kind of looking with eyes closed uh, around that situation and trying to explore how long is this one going to last? Uh, when is this going to end? What will be different this time? Is there something different from the last time? Yeah, that's great. This is where I'm at with it too. I recently had one I haven't had. I grew up with it calling, calling them night terrors as well. Uh, I recently had one and I haven't in a very long time and definitely since before we started Nux Minte, and it, at least that I can, that was vivid and intense like this. And I wanted to, as soon as I addressed it, as soon as I, I kind of came out of it, I wanted to go back in and explore it. And somehow I missed that. But, but it was, it was like a new experience to me because it had been so long. It was a big gray hand and a being and, you know, I, and I called in my mother and my brother of all people, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> but, you know, it's not in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I called in my mother and brother. <laughs> oh man. I do. I do think it's interesting that I did go through a huge period of time uh, exploring who as a person who wasn't raised with any religion. I do remember in my 20s going through a period of time where I explored in trying to invoke different deities to save me from the night terrors. Um, so whether that be Jesus or Buddha or uh, just Jehovah, God, uh, angels, uh, anybody to come and get me out of that nightmare. I think that that's a really interesting part of of when I was really fascinated by them in my 20s. How, yeah. how often did that work? Uh, the majority of the time it didn't. And <laughs> that, really, that really freaked me out. <laughs> that, there was, that there was none of these great uh, elder beings of, of light and love could save me from myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did any work? Uh, no, as a matter of fact. Uh, I just, at a certain point, uh, like I said, I just realized, oh, this is just happening. This is this is just something that happened. Uh, so just continue to experience that. Uh, you're not really, you don't really seem to be in control. Uh, and that's okay to not always be in control. Yeah, absolutely. I find it's so funny, you know, how we get, how people get caught up in their, in their in their culture right and and so the cultural icons and you know i mean hindus are going to call on one christians are going to call on another and and people like us that didn't really get anything i i you know i called on my dead mother and brother and, right. and and still nothing happens and it's such a great lesson because in the end it, it is you who has to deal with it. yeah i think it's interesting too that even in in my waking world like uh if i want to invoke uh some kind of deity like um so in my magical practices and then the things that i do to relax myself um like i will uh sit and kind of focus and ground myself and uh Kind of call on my elders so it's even like uh kajoliael which is all of the, my four grandparents uh and i've kind of combined them into one big kind of protective deity that i talk to and that i ask for strength i like that i, I like that and for, in the way i'm wired that makes complete sense to me yeah i mean as i was you know throughout the years and and knowing friends who did magic and me doing magic and witchcraft and anything that you know i wanted to as i was exploring i always thought to myself if there's anybody on the other side that is looking out for me it's it's probably my grandparents mm -hmm. yeah this it, the older i get to the more the ancestral stuff really is 
uh, holding a lot of weight. And this is, I don't know if it's a genetic memory. I mean, there's so many ways we could parse this out, but it, it is, kind of, there's more gravity for me in, in the personal elders now. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, as a matter of fact, the, so my mother's mother, uh, Josephine, had passed away before I was born, so I never even knew her. And uh, two years ago or three years ago, uh, my mother had congestive heart failure and she was in the hospital and she was in an induced coma and I was spending the nights with her. My sister was there during the day and I was there during the night. And I was sitting there next to my mother holding her hand and I slipped off into a dream. And this really kind of beautiful uh, mid 20 year old woman came to me in the dream and, and she said, uh, I never met you. She didn't introduce herself. She just said, I never met you, uh, but thank you for taking care of my daughter. I really wish I would have met you. You seem to be a very good man. And I woke up and I thought, wow, that's crazy. I, I think that was grandma, uh, but I don't really know because I've only ever seen pictures of her when she was older. And uh, I thought, well, it's just a stress dream, and I've been thinking a lot about family. And after my mom recovered and got out of the hospital, we were sitting up one night, and my mother said to me, I, I don't want this to sound too strange, but you know, a few months ago when I was in the hospital, uh, I had the most vivid dream that you were talking to my mom, except she was young. And she wanted you to know that she was proud of you for taking care of me, and she thinks that you've become a very good man. Oh wow, John, that's another from and and from your mother again. Uh that's some more goosebumps from me over here. That's that's high validation in my mind. Yeah, I uh you know, I, I I'm completely open with my emotions. It was very emotional for me to hear that because it was validation that something had occurred. I don't know if it was my grandmother or if I was meeting my mother in a different separate space while we were both in that dreamscape or what was happening, but something had indeed happened. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's how I'm hearing it as well. On this note of, of those that have passed, especially, do you, so have you had dreams that involve uh people you know that have passed before they've passed have you had any of those kind of premonition dreams with death nope not at all what about after so uh, yeah, other than you know obviously your grandmother your great grandmother here that was uh that was very uncommon usually uh i recently a couple of years ago lost uh one of the drummers from one of my very first bands who I was close to for years and years. And even after he passed, like he didn't show up in any dreams, still hasn't. Um, so I've always internalized that experience of not having an experience as, <laughs> as them understanding that I already know that there's something else. And so they need not bother with me. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good way to look at it. It, but, it, I'm sorry. No, go on, Jerry. That kind of implies then that their purpose is only to inform of their presence instead of befriending or guiding? Um, no, I think that for a lot of people, and, and I discussed this with uh, people, I was just talking about it this weekend with someone, a gentleman approached me and asked why his, his mother, who had recently passed, why she hadn't come to him. And I said, you know, I can only, I can't give you any answers. I can only tell you my thoughts about the situation. And I think that in many instances, when a loved one passes, sometimes them appearing to you will actually do you more harm uh, than good. I think that sometimes they can recognize when you need to be able to learn to move on without them giving you something to help you move on. Oh, I, get, I get that totally. I get that too. And it, and yeah, like when I, when my mama died, it was just so traumatic every time she popped in and she cut, you know, she just kept popping in actually quite often. And, and everyone's heard me talk about this, but I had to push her into other rooms behind glass because I was so emotional and it was, it would actually 
it set me my morning process back, even though I don't believe we die. And so, you know, energy is energy. It transmutes and all this. But it was it was really difficult for me to process her her coming to visit via dreams. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously each of us are different. And when we transform into whatever we transform into, I think we transform differently because we are all different. And we might have slight characteristics, but I think some people just like to visit. Yes. Well, and I, I had actually made a pact with my mom. And so I think, you know, that being said, I, I think she was just keeping up her end of the bargain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I told sure. you I was coming to get you, bitch. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had just such a great relationship. What, so, what about lucidity in your dreams? What's the level? you attain and so for me lucidity goes everywhere from you know really hypnagogic all the way to full awareness and obes so it's a sliding scale sure um when I, years ago probably in my late teens to mid 20s is when i really was practicing lucid dreaming when i was really in there shaping and trying to do things and then at a certain point I felt that I was robbing myself of an experience by shaping the experience. And so I stopped doing that altogether so that I could just have a kind of pure dream experience, even though while in the dream world, I would understand that, oh, because there is that kind of recognized neighborhood, right? Where sometimes you're in a dream and you're walking down a street and you realize you've been on that street and you know that what's behind that door in that building because you've been in there. And so the most I would do in a lucid dream uh, is explore an area that I hadn't explored in an already familiar setting. When you realize that you're in the dream, is there a sh does it shift your consciousness? Just the realization is, you know, a high form of lucidity, in my opinion. And uh, how does that shift? So, so you ex it, it it prompts you to explore the landscape. But is is there are there other shifts that happen internally for you as far as like consciousness? Yeah, there's the moment when you do realize that you're in the dream. Um, at least for me, there's uh, you know, time is irrelevant. But there's a a a dream moment, a dream second. Uh, of anxiety, realizing that my physical form is somewhere else asleep. Um, and then I get through that pretty quickly. But there is this, that, that conscious realization that my, my physical form is, is kind of laying unprotected somewhere else. And that, that makes me nervous in the dream world. In the beginning of those experiences, did the idea that your your physical vessel was elsewhere did did you ever think perhaps you had died uh so we haven't gotten into this yet so when i was 18 um i had a heart attack and died so i was down for a minute and a half the first time and then they got me back and then i was down again for a minute and a half um and then they got me back again and um before that happened there was always a fear that perhaps, and I mean, this is going to be a year a year before I died, uh, is probably when I was really paying attention to dreams. So probably 17, 16 and a half to 17, uh, I started paying attention to dreams. And so there was maybe a lot more anxiety. And then after my death experience, there was not a lot of anxiety thinking that I had been dead because it was so, the dream state was so unlike what I had experienced when I was dead. Could you tell us about your NDE then, please? Uh, sure. So. Or uh, actually your death experience, not yeah, near. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, there are th basically 
you can break down the death experience into three experiences that most people have. And the first one is the one that most people hear, which is love and light and the tunnel of love and light and balloons and kittens and puppies. And it's all very awesome. Uh, and there are people waiting for you and waving. and It's really great. Um, and then the second one that you hear the most about is people being having an OBE. Uh, they're watching the doctors work on them or they're on the roof of the ambulance looking down at their own body. That's pretty much the second most talked about. And then the third one, which is mine and the least common for people to talk about, is a kind of null experience, which is, uh, and this is never easy for me to talk about just because the null experience is void. It, it's completely void of everything except for your consciousness being aware that there is nothing else but your consciousness. And so even by me calling my consciousness my consciousness and by calling it void, I'm giving it some type of shape and form, which makes me think that I'm describing it incorrectly. Uh, so I became aware, uh, I died and at some point became aware that I was solely a non-corporeal being and that I was the only non-corporeal being and that I existed forever and was going to exist forever uh, and that there had never been anything else and that there never would be anything else. And um, that went on literally at the time, literally forever. Uh, and to a certain degree, uh, the PTSD that you some people have with death experiences that I experience with anxiety. Uh, even when I talk about it and start to think about it, I think to myself, like, is this conversation I'm having with you and is this life I'm living, is this a kind of compartmentalization of my consciousness because I don't want to continue to realize that I'm still inside of infinity? I completely get that and, uh, and share share a bit of that anxiety with and with some of my journey it, it, when so when when you came back from this so you're 18 years old and okay just for a timeline here you're 18 is this before you went on what's now been your life work you know into all the stuff you investigate this is it seems like it's right around that time so for a, a, a kind of broken down timeline of stuff, uh, I was a weird comic booky, uh, science fictiony kid who went into punk rock bands and still loved uh, sci science fiction and supernatural and horror stuff. And uh, when I was fifteen, is when uh, the one, the girl I was dating at the time uh, told me her house was haunted, and so. I went to go uh, get the ghost out of her house and I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I took, I, I, as a non-religious person, I was like, I think I need a Bible and white candles or something. <laughs> and, and I went in there and, and uh, that was kind of my first uh, venture into a haunted house as a ghost hunter. I didn't know, know that people really kind of did that. Uh, and after that experience, I started going to metaphysical conventions and making friends that were ceremonial magicians because I would meet them at psychic fairs. And so that really started to spin up around 16. Okay. So you were already swimming in these waters really at 18. For sure. Absolutely. So when, when you come out of this NDE, did you, or your death experience, I, you, you did kind of tell, you did kind of give us this, but what was your initial response to those around you about it? So I left the hospital and moved. I had just moved out on when it had happened. I had just moved out on my own for the first time. I'd only been moved out of the house for a few months. And when I got out of the hospital, I moved back into my parents' house. And that was the middle of January, because January 21st is, is when I died. Um, and then I didn't leave the area of my childhood bedroom. There's a bathroom right next door to the, the door to the bedroom. I didn't leave that kind of area of the bedroom in the bathroom until August. 
I stayed in there and refused all visitors except for my family. Was there a paranoia? Absolutely. 100%. That either I was going to die or was still dead. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something I entertain to this day with some of my journey. I still question if I'm alive. I mean, so like, I. What, what is it? I'm <laughs> like, I, there, there's just a couple experiences where there's no way I made it out. And yet somehow I did. And uh, it, you still question this? I do. Um, constantly. I yeah. Do. I, this is, this is the weirding and I'm, I'm very glad to hear this. I'm hearing more people talk about it, thankfully. I, I so I want to tie this into, and I was very happy to find this as I was listening to stuff of you, um, and kind of digging around yesterday into exorcisms. Yes. And I have not personally ever talked to anyone that was involved with a real Catholic church exorcism, and you had the pleasure of doing that. I did. So in 1999, the, a friend of mine, uh, his family worked for the Archdiocese of Detroit, and he put me in contact with the Archdiocese because they were looking for a non-Catholic to be, play the part of what they call a disinterested third party during a uh, exorcism that was being uh, sanctioned by the Holy See. So uh, I said yes, because when someone asks you to do something weird that seems safe, say yes. And I went and talked to them and went through uh, actually months. Uh, it's so different than what people would imagine it to be. So as soon as I say yes to the archdiocese, uh, they immediately tell me, first of all, it's probably never going to happen. We very rarely ever do it. Uh, so just be forewarned that you're probably not going to see this thing that's going on that uh, we think might happen. Uh, they sent me to, you know, I, I got to pick my doctor, but they sent me to a doctor and I did a stress test to make sure that I was uh, physically capable of going through watching this exorcism. Uh, I got to pick and go to a therapist to talk to someone to make sure I was cognitively able to process the experience that I was going to see. And the whole time for months, you know, I'm getting a phone call every week saying, you know, uh, it's still not happening, but, you know, just hold on. It might, it might not. We don't know. And then finally, you know, one day I get a phone call that says, um, it's happening. We're sending a car to pick you up. So get ready. And it could be, you know, three minutes. It could be three hours. It could be three days. So uh, just be aware. And then a car came and picked me up and drove me into northern Michigan. I walked into a room that had a priest, an assisting priest. Uh, the client was uh, on a bed, it was just a, actually just a mattress on the floor and was restrained. Uh, there were no, everything had been taken off the walls. There was nothing else in the room except that balsa wood table and the uh, accoutrement of the priests. Um, there was a small closet in the bathroom attached to the room and the doors uh, had been taken off. And once they, you know, I had been told, you know, once you go into that room, you're not going to come out until this is over. And so the three of, well, the priest, the assisting priest, and I, and the client, four of us, uh, were there for just about 32 hours while this exorcism took place. And so, and this, I just, I was so fascinated with this story. And I, I know you've told it, but I just, I want it in the Knox Mente sure. narrative overall, because it fits into everything we're getting at. So... And as you said, when I was listening, they've done this for hundreds of years. They're really strict, the Catholic Church. They're really strict about the perimeters uh, under which it happens. And, um, and they have it down to a science, like taking everything out and that it's balsa wood in case, you know, it doesn't splinter. Those kinds of things, which I had not actually never foddered on, you know, never chewed that around, these ideas. And of course, that's logical. So, yeah, there's no, you know, it's, it's weird because it was taking place in a place that they had found that suited their parameters. You know, there can't be any windows, um, you know, there can't be any attached shelving. Like it's a bare stripped down empty room. Um, you know, even in the bathroom, the toilet seat lid is taken off of the toilet. Um, the toilet has to be tankless. There's no tank on the toilet. 
Uh, there's no curtain rod or, you know, shower bar or anything like that. There's nothing in the bathroom except, you know, in case you need to go in the bathroom. And, you know, and, and that that's what I want people to, to consider here is this is coming from a very old tradition and these things are well thought out. So if they're stripping it down, you can venture to wonder ponder uh let your mind go where it may that things fly around it's possible even though you didn't personally experience that there must be some sort of uh there's a precedent for this there's a reason why of such an old tradition and as we, you know as we know they they vet these 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 experiences and people that are possessed out so when you're having this experience and this is how old were you around this time so i was 29 okay so this is like over, saturn you know, return saturn return 10 years a little over 10, 11 years after your your death experience mm -hmm. uh so you get you get in and can you give us just a fast rundown of the stuff that really convinced you that something else was really going on here that this sure. was legit sure um so in that process of like talking to therapists and uh preparing myself when they you know went to the doctor and did the stress test and all that you're also talking to you know people from the archdiocese and the people who are actually trying to do all of the work and one of the things that i was told over and over again is you know you're there basically as an insurance policy for the client. You're a non-Catholic, you don't have any you know, ties to the Catholic Church. So you're there to watch, uh, to make sure there's no impropriety with the client. Um, and you're also not allowed to interact at all. So you cannot respond to the client, you can't talk, uh, the priest is never gonna ask you any questions. Uh, you, you are just solely there to stand the entire time and watch the proceedings. And they very much so repeated over and over again, um, the client will try and engage you and the client will engage you in ways that will make you want to re-engage with the client. Uh, you have to push past that. And so the moment when I realized that something was happening beyond my full reckoning, um, was many hours into the exorcism and the client sleeps a lot of the time. Uh, there are these very uh, violent uh, outbursts that happen, but then the client sleeps for extended periods of time and you try and get some rest. Uh, I did in the bathroom sitting on the floor while the, the priest and the assisting priest slept in the other room near the client on the floor. Um, but there was one, one point many hours in when during a particularly violent outburst where the client stopped, um, his breathing completely changed normally, and he went from heavy breathing to a kind of soft breathing, became very kind uh, looking and spoken, like gave off this air, this air of kindness, and then turned and looked at me and rapidly changed uh, just the shift in his face language. And he looked straight at me and, and said, uh, do you remember when you were six and your mother gave you a Spider-Man coloring book and you threw it back in her face and said you had it, your mother thinks about that all the time and it breaks her heart. And that was something that I had done that I had never told anyone. Oh. <laughs> so how did you process that in the moment? Uh, it hit me like a baseball bat. Uh, the fact that this very deep, kind of and, and obviously i know i was a child and 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 all of that but it's something that you just it's a, one of those moments as a little kid that you hold in your heart and you just think what a dick i was when i was a little kid and uh for it, that to be pulled out and then even talked about in front of other people uh it was very much like my mind was laid bare to that entire room that that my mind had become transparent to something and it was a very overwhelmingly frightening experience. Did you respond outwardly at all? 
I, um, I'm, <laughs> I didn't say anything. I'm sure that my body posture and language <laughs> radically shifted, uh, but I, I didn't respond to it, but I, it, it did hit me like a ton of bricks. And then also, I'd like to get in on this ad that this was like a, a country person, right? And they, because you said uh, in another interview that this person spoke other languages. And I think you mentioned maybe like a, an Asian, like a Chinese one or something. Mandarin. Uh, so this is a very... Uh, mostly uneducated rural northern Michigan person uh, who at certain times uh, spoke many different languages, but the priests themselves uh, knew the Italian and the Latin and what I assumed to be Spanish, because some of the words sounded familiar from high school. Uh, but there was a, a period of time, and this overall, I mean, the experience obviously very uh, intense and it's something that can radically shift the way you think about this experience but the most important part to me about the exorcism was this moment uh, because I was told that no one would ever come into the room and so when the client started speaking what I thought was Japanese and then I didn't I, it sounded Asian to me and then I realized it wasn't Japanese it was Chinese um, and no one understood it there was uh, the assisting priest got up and went to the door. Now, there are also um, other assisting priests who are outside in the hallway, and you can open the door. There's this weird lock that they put on the door that, so you can open it up a little bit and talk to the people in the hallway. Um, and the assisting priest got up, walked over, opened the door, said something to the people out in the hallway, and you, know, you could ask for a, a creamsicle, and they'll hand you a creamsicle to the Vatican. They have like unlimited resources. And he said something to the people out in the hallway. And about an hour and a half later, uh, they actually unlocked the door. And uh, a man who was wearing the garb of a Buddhist uh, had come into the room. A Buddhist monk came into the room and was translating for us uh, what the client was saying. And he uh, assisted the uh, priest and assisting priest with the exorcism. So in in the languages that were able to be translated, did you were you privy to what was being said? Uh, not really, because um, I mean, I was picking up just from being a human being and, and catching words here and there. But the priests and assisting priest, or the priest and the assisting priest, uh, they also did not respond very often to the kind of attacks. They just kind of focused on their business and, and kept at it. Do you think those languages, <clears throat> the, the person speaking in those languages was addressing the other individuals with you in their native tongue, perhaps? Uh, it could have been. Uh, I also thought sometimes that it was an uh, obfuscation tactic to, to, to see the abilities of the people in the room to see if any of us were actually understanding what was going on, to see if it could outthink us. Hmm. So in, in, in this experience, was there, so what was the general, so after you get deep into it, you've been there hours, all this is transpiring, you, you know, it's brought forth something from your deep childhood. Uh, and then all these languages. And so now you're, you know, the, the suspension of disbelief is there. <laughs> you know, you're in pain. <laughs> For sure, yes. <laughs> was, what was the feeling in this, in this space now? So where I'm trying to go with this is that at some point I want to overlap this with, uh, the, with dream, the way there's things are hyper in dream. So what was the feeling and the mood when you got deep into this experience? So there is a very uh, dreamlike ex part of the experience because you're exhausted, you're emotionally worn down, you're not sleeping well, uh, you're not getting probably enough REM sleep because you keep waking up every couple hours when the client wakes up. 
Um, and so there is this very dreamlike quality at a certain point where you're looking around and I'm trying to figure out like, is this like, I know what I'm seeing and I know that I'm here, but am I really, is this really going on? Is this really happening? And, you know, there are, aside from the languages and stuff, there are very difficult to reconcile body positions and, and, and things that the client did that seemed like they should have dislocated bones and shoulders and joints and didn't. Um, and you're also watching a priest and an assisting priest who are acting like this is just, uh, something they do. Like this is just a job and that adds to a very unreal quality to it. Uh, especially right near the end. So one of the other things that I had been prepared for when they told me it would, you know, try and get me to react to it. Uh, I was also told there will be a moment near the end of the exorcism when everybody in the room will know for sure uh, that you will be dead in the next few minutes and moments. Uh, you just have to push through that. It's the last gasp. And that was absolutely true. There was a moment where the client uh, went into a very violent outburst and this air filled the room and everything became completely still and calm and extremely dreamlike and my heart started racing and my blood pressure went up and I, I could just hear ringing in my ears and I was looking at the assisting priest and he was looking at the, the, the priest, um, the father who was performing the, the actual ceremonies and uh, we were all just transfixed in this moment that we were going to die, we were all going to die. and then in a snap of fingers the client was asleep and the three of us in the room were laughing and smiling and it was over wow i i love the i love the laughing part at the end you know how that really dispels so much energy even if it's nervous laughter and i'm one of those nervous laughter people for sure but it was just such a deep relief and almost almost the brains of all three of us in the room realizing just this ridiculous experience we've been through not the exorcism but just reality being human and having to do things like this it was just this very bolsterous laughter that just burst out of all of us so moving forward to now now that that's in in the realm of memory, right? And what, so, and as you retell it and you sort of talk about it and you pull it back up from, from, from memory, what do you make of it all? Because clearly the, the Vatican's invested in the fact that it's a demon. Right. Um, so the important, so I have, all of the television shows and things that I've worked on when we were talking off mic earlier about having NDAs, uh, whether that's the people that can't talk about me or I can't talk about other people. I break my non-disclosure agreements with networks all the time because they're just television shows and, and I don't like to have secret. Um, but you also sign an NDA with the, with the Vatican. So like, I'm not supposed to be talking about any of this, but I think it's important for people to talk about these type of things. And um, I actually mentioned this once, and I, I started talked about it a little bit on uh, some. For some reason, I was being interviewed by Fox and News, and I mentioned it. And I actually, this was years later. This was in 2015. I mentioned it on Fox News, and about two weeks later, I got a phone call from the Archdiocese of Detroit saying, "You can't talk about this on on the news like this." Um, but the important part for me, the important part of breaking the N NDA. Um, was after the client, uh, after the exorcism was over, uh, there's this kind of uh, sit down kind of breakout period where me and the assisting priest and the priest and some other people from the archdiocese and actually that, that monk who had been there where we're all sitting around a couple days later and we're talking kind of through the experience with each other and if we're okay and how we feel and you know, what are your thoughts? And do you have any questions? And my question, this is why I think it's important for me to break the NDA. My question to the, the priest who performed the exorcism was I said, 
my question is, I just watched a Catholic exorcism and I watched you perform it with a Buddhist. How do you reconcile that with the Catholic faith? And he smiled at me and he said, uh, if you think that the major religions of the world don't understand that there's a single force called by different names, then you're incorrect in that thinking. Wow, that's important. That's very important. Uh, and actually, I find that rather comforting as a person that does subscribe to when you get to a certain level, everyone understands these veins, if you will, of energy, and that they they really have no sector. They overlap. For sure. And, you know, when I heard him say that, my, of course, my human reaction to him, you know, he said that smiling and looking at me very kind and open. And I looked at him in kind of frustration. And then said, why can't you acknowledge that? And he said, the, the tribes are separated. Mm -hmm. And it would be too difficult to convince them of what we're doing. Yeah. And of course, I'm sure you understand that on like the hierarchical in, in magical orders and stuff. It's like you pay, you pay, you pay as a participant. And then you get to a level where you don't pay, you know, it, and it's all the unders. or. Um, where you cross a threshold and there's it's there's there's more overlap with other uh old schools speech here brotherhoods than than people know or realize it's just you have to get to that certain are you level. there can you hear me yeah i'm sorry my computer for some reason just closed yeah, you were, you were kind of in and out. I, Jerry, I was thinking the same thing. That's all I was thinking about the whole time he was talking. I'm like, he's going to drop off. <laughs> Yay, well, I, we get to say somebody interfered. Yeah, I don't I'm that. quite uh, thankful that you mentioned that and brought that here and um, and are, are forthright uh, in other places with it. I, so... I, I want to linger in this this for a minute in with the idea of hierarchies of energetic beings. So whatever you want to call them, and since you've been in this field a very long time, uh, you know, fairy, demons, ETs, all of that. How do you, and this stuff is all significant to the the conversation of dreams and dreaming, because that's a portal, in my opinion, a, a portal of perception. And how how do you categorize these things at this point, having had hard experiences like that, and and then personal experiences like your death experience as well that took you out of this particular space for like for true true uh what are they john so for for me my internal it it's hard because my inter obviously we all have this internal dialogue we use with ourselves that's kind of beyond language and so the the way that i've learned to discuss it outside of my own mind is that the universe, uh, reality, is um, a, is a game. It's only ever created, and all it's ever done is is played. It's it just does things. It loves to do things. It loves to make things and destroy things and create things and and demolish them and. It has an infinite variety of shape and form, and it, and it creates things to play within itself. And so every time you do something, every, you're interacting with reality, uh, whether it's dreaming, or whether it's going ghost hunting, whether it's just uh, choosing to have a sandwich, whether it's choosing to be a carnivore or a vegan, like every time you make a choice, you're actually making a move and the universe plays back 
because it's not being evil and mean. It's not trying to win. It's just playing. And I think that when it comes to fairies and uh, interdimensional beings and aliens, I think at a certain point, uh, as you gain experience and as you gain knowledge and as you enjoy playing the game, as you learn to just solely have this pure joy in engaging with the universe, it starts to add other players to your game. And it's doing the same thing with them. Uh, the universe's move is just putting a fairy into your life or putting an alien into your life. And of course, it's playing with that alien too, and it's just put you into its life. And so now we're all engaged in this game. But I think our what's problematic as humans is we have such a desire to win. We don't realize that wh how you win is just by being happy that you're playing. So how is it that one gets to the point of being possessed? And I mean, you really experienced this through a Catholic exorcism. This was a possession and you gave us these amazing details. So how, how does one, with all this said, how does that actually happen? So, I mean, I was told, uh-oh, I have internet connection unstable. Can you hear me? I hear you yeah, fine it, 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 You're past it. That usually shows up afterwards. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I was told by the Archdiocese and the Vatican representatives that anyone that is possessed uh, has worked toward it, that they have wanted to become possessed, and that they have done the necessary work to become possessed, that you cannot be uh, in the midst of full possession uh, simply by saying, I wish a demon would come inside of me. That's not going to do anything. You have to do the work to become possessed. Um, and so that's what that gentleman, our client, had done. So when, so hearing that, I'm still, I'm still confused. So was he, was he actively doing rituals to get possessed or was it was it passive like you know just being a raging drunk and allowing you know stepping out of his body like i guess i'm confused as to which so, path so you know there whether you want to call it ritual or just purposefulness uh doing harm uh doing uh, bad works, playing the game, uh, what I was just talking about, the game, like playing it to win in a way that would only benefit you, uh, completely self-serving uh, with no regard for any other person, um, and, you know, making all of the difficult choices which make reality in the universe more difficult for anyone else, and wanting to have a negativity inside of you wanting to be the personification of what he believed was evil. I find that I find that uh, poignant and especially having dealt with someone I, I truly believe courted that passively like that by just being nasty her whole life and there was this point and so I'm not going to go into the story but I there was a point where I realized she was actually and I don't pass this word around very often except for when Jerry and I are joking that everything's demons but she was really possessed for real I I experienced craziness around her paranormal craziness and just rotten terrible terrible things mm -hmm. so it 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 changed and it, it took me i mean we were lifelong friends so it took me a very long time to realize it and then of course she had a legendary death that made just news everywhere uh so this is fascinating in so coming back to the dreamscape with all of this said have you experienced so i get a little bit of this what's your experience of the concept or the the actuality of say precog deja vu type stuff 
Yeah, uh, I've actually had not a number, but I have a very uh, vivid few uh, precognitive dreams. Um, obviously, you know, when I had them as an example, to give you an example of one of them, uh, when I was probably 16 or 17, I had a very weird, very vivid dream of uh, I was shopping and I was buying a blender uh, and uh, oranges and I was pushing around my shopping cart and there was punk rock music playing in the grocery store that I was in or the whatever store I was in. And I couldn't believe that as, as, as I was looking at blenders, I turned and looked and I couldn't believe that there was uh, a row of shirts that had all of these vines and weapons uh, entwined in the vines while this punk rock music was playing in the store that I was shopping in. And I kind of woke up from that dream and I, I, I have kept a dream diary. I didn't write that one down because it was so vivid. I wrote it down later, um, probably a, a couple of years later. Uh, but it wasn't until I think 1997, so we're talking about 10 years later, uh, I was living on my own and I went shopping at a, a Meyer Thrifty Acre, a 24-hour uh, store for your listeners who don't have Meyer where they're at. Uh, 24-hour sell everything store, and I realized um, as I was pushing this shopping cart that was had a bag of oranges in it uh, that I was in the blender aisle, and that Green Day was actually playing. And I thought to myself, I hadn't realized this dream. I had had this dream yet. Like I, I didn't realize it was the dream that I was inside of. Um, and I thought to myself, oh, we're in that era where punk rock is acceptable now. Uh, that's why they're playing Green Day in the store. And as I turned and had that thought and then realized, oh, I've had this as a dream, I've had this experience as a dream, and I started to get anxious, I turned to my head and there was a rack of shirts for sale for Guns N' Roses. And it was all of the rose vines entwi entwined around the pistols for Guns N' Roses. And I stood there for a moment looking at this blender and oranges and listening to Green Day and seeing the Guns N' Roses shirts completely realizing that this was a dream I had had 10 years earlier and I didn't buy anything and just immediately left. <laughs> was that part of the dream too? No, the, the, the dream ended with me waking up. Okay. I, I mean, I, I immediately, like, I just left the cart and I was like, this is too much right now. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I cannot handle this. And I just went out in the parking lot, got my car and drove home. What's extra crazy is that I'm having a deja vu as you're telling this. <laughs> so, well, so what, what do you make of that experience? What do you, how, how do you view it today? Um, I, I still, when, you know, I've had, uh, like I said, I've had a few that are like that. And I've never, ever been able to reconcile if my consciousness has jumped forward in time, um, if I have lived this life before, and I'm just having a deep memory of it, and it's revealing itself to me in the past, uh, or perhaps if my future is somehow retroactively uh, changing my past, um, I've never been able to, to figure out why that happens, why it happens, why you can go from the dream world where things are just bizarre. I had, uh, when I was 20, one of the other dreams that I had, which was very short, but um, significant to me, was I was the dream is that I'm in my high school and I'm running through the high school down the hallways. It's completely empty and uh, the lockers seem so much smaller to me than they normally are when I was in high school. And as I run forward down this hallway, I, I hit these doors at the end of the hallway and they're, they're chain bolted with these huge chains and I pull on them. And then I reach into my pocket and I unlock it and I walk through the doors. And in the dream, that's where I wake up. And it was uh, probably 1998, so probably seven or eight years later, uh, I was visiting a friend of mine who was a custodian in my high school. And I had told him that I would meet him uh, outside where we used to smoke cigarettes when we went to that high school and he gave me a key to one of the padlocked doors 
And there were some, uh, as I was walking down the hallways, uh, I saw a police lights outside. And so I started running down the hallways. And as I was running down the hallway, I realized, oh, this is that dream. And the lockers looked shorter um, and smaller because I had, I, I, in my mind, I have so far removed from high school, like realized how, how small I was in high school. And as I'm thinking about that, I don't even realize that I'm running forward into the doors that are locked by the chain. And I hit them and the big chains rattle and I reach in my pocket and I'm like, this is exactly what happened in the dream. And I unlock the chains and I walk through the doors and went outside. And uh, my friend was talking to a police officer, but you know, that part wasn't the dream. That's that's a, a fantastic example. Is So do you, are these happening more often the older you get where you're having a recall to these earlier dreams? No, the last one that I had was probably three years ago when I didn't, so I recalled the dream in the moment that it was happening, which was, uh, it's, it's so funny because this is the thing that I kind of love about this experience of rem remembering this dream. I remember when I first had, so, okay. Sorry for trying to process this because I don't think I've ever talked about it, but I was doing a lecture at a comic book convention in Michigan, and I was sitting in the green room um, where all the guests gather, and I was uh, eating some Ritz crackers, and I was explaining to all of these uh, pro wrestlers, these old pro wrestlers like Hacksaw Jim Dugan and Greg the Hammer Valentine, and all these wrestlers from the 70s and 80s, I was explaining to them why I was vegetarian. And they were all laughing and telling me I needed to bulk up and have more protein or whatever, whatever. And Rowdy Roddy Piper walked in, uh, unbeknownst to me, and had listened to the conversation. And he walked up behind me and put a hot dog next to the side of my head. And he said, you're going to eat this hot dog. And I turned and looked at it and the table got quiet. And then they all kind of laughed. And I looked at them and I said, well, I guess I'm going to eat this hot dog because Rowdy will put me to sleep in a sleeper hole. Then everybody laughed and I took a bite of it and everybody laughed and, and that was kind of the end. And as that was happening, I remembered the dream that I had probably as a 12 or 13 year old that seemed at the time completely wild, which was me sitting at a table with all of these pro wrestlers and Rowdy Roddy Piper feeding me hot dogs. And the thing that cracks me up the most is the situation when I'm 12 or 13 years old that seems completely untenable and absolutely ridiculous and could never happen in a million years happens and makes total sense when it's happening as to why I'm there and what's happening. This is, the, and this is, I, so I wanna, it, it goes exactly where I wanna go. And in Mira's experiences, I, am currently having so yes that's what's amazing is stuff that you think was implausible and when you recognize it happening there's this uh i don't know if it's a, a neural pathway opening or what it's like a time loop i'm not sure so where where does t where do timelines fall into all this between dream and waking and free will Absolutely. Yeah. I think about it all the time. Like how, if I'm randomly choosing <laughs> the things that I do throughout my life, how have these repeated occurrences happened? How, you know, the, the, not even so much deja vu experience, but sometimes I'm just, I travel a lot and I'm, you know, driving through a city that I've never been through before and recognize the houses that, as I pass through it. And I don't recognize them as places that I've been. I recognize them as places that I've passed in a car as I pass them, as I'm doing in the moment. And that happens very frequently, actually. Yeah, that's in specific exactly what, what's been going on with me. I'm, I'll be driving and I'm like, oh, Mike, 
God. I remember seeing it on new roads, you know, like the, I remember this road and that how I love old architecture. So my eye is just always on old houses in particular. And, uh, you know, the, just this, just, I could give example after example of that. It, and it seems mundane if you just pluck it out of context, but when you start throwing it into a grid of uh, of imagery and of data and all the stuff that one amasses over a lifetime, it starts to look suspiciously um, like there's an architect there of some sort. And, I, and, 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 and I think I think what's interesting too. I love that you said that, and and I wrote an article about. So talking to all of the people that I've talked to across the span of almost 30 years now, one of the really truly weird scenarios that comes up a lot that I've never seen people really talk about or write about, I wrote a little article about it on a weird lecture, and I, I've actually called it transient environment phenomena, which is you live in a town for 10 years, you travel the same way to work every single day, and one day you notice a house that you've never noticed before or a barn that you've seen on the road for 15 years is just gone and was never there. Um, I've lived in the same city, Royal Oak, my entire life. And I've, I've been a school bus driver here. I've lived in the city my whole life. I've owned a business here. I've worked for business here. I've walked the streets as a punk rock kid. I've traversed the streets as a mayoral candidate. Like, And still, I will go down a street that I've been down a million times and all of a sudden, boom, I, it happened today. As a matter of fact, driving down Rochester Road, like all of a sudden there's a house that I'd never seen in my entire life uh, just sitting there. And it's obviously been there for years and years and years. I've just never seen it before. I've, I've heard that described as time slips. Uh, sure. I've heard stories like gas stations that appear that burned down 20 years ago, but it was there the night, you know, someone drove by, was in need of it, actually. The interesting thing is I studied, as I studied that phenomenon, started asking people about it. One of the things that I discovered was that it's individual specific. So like when I saw the house on Rochester Road today that I've never seen before, I was actually with my father. And I said, oh, uh, and I, I said to him out loud, I said, I've never noticed that house before. And he was like, yeah. And he said something very flippantly about it, like, uh, it's, a, it's a monstrosity because it is a very big house. And so one of the things you know, earlier years ago when I was actually kind of researching this more was I realized that a lot of the things with what, what I'm thinking about with this transient environment phenomena, it's individual specific. You're the only one that has noticed that it changed. So it's almost different from like what people call Mandela effect, where you have large groups of people recognizing that something's changed. It's an individual, something in your world has completely changed and you're the only one that noticed that. Yeah. I haven't had that happen yet. <laughs> I'm having a lot of that happen right now, and that's my question to you. Is that phenomena amping up for you? It's it's not, but along those lines, um, moving my parents into my house, my dad, they uh, when they retired, they moved up to northern Michigan. And so I had been spending a lot of time up in northern Michigan on my parents' property, and they have about 100 acres up there of just forest. Um, and my dad has trail cams set up so he can look at the deer and the bear that's there. And uh, he has thousands upon thousands of these photos from his trail cam. And you can just sit and kind of flip through them and make a movie. And I think it was about two or three years ago, as I was flipping through these trail cam photographs, just thousands of them on an SD card, one at a time, I would notice what seems to be a changing environment in the sense that when I say that, um, in one frame off of a thousand photographs, uh, a tree will be gone in one photograph and then it's back in the next photograph. Like it's popping, like it's popping out of, <laughs> like it's popping out of existence and then popping back in. And I found it on multiple trail cams, different trees, different plants, as if they're not always there. Like they go somewhere for just one shot. And sometimes, you know, a way a trail cam shoots with a deer or something like that, you'll get like five shots within, you know, 30 seconds. 
And, yes. and, and sometimes it's just one of those five shots in 30 seconds where the tree is gone or the bush is gone and then it's back in all of the rest and it's always there. So I asked people online and at my lectures if they had trail cams to start looking through them and other people have found this to be happening too. This is, so for people in my personal life, this is stuff I've been really invest talking with because it does seem, I just, you know, there's this line of, it's the weirding and you know that you're my weird brother, right? Mm -hmm. The W-I-R-D yep. and our W-Y. And it, it is the weirding and those of us looking, and as I always say, you know, we what you feed grows uh, these and especially those of us that are really open the there's so much that's possible anything really and uh, i i'm just having this crazy experience lately just so many time shifts and all this and i i want to ask you this and I want your opinion on this. So we see that in, and I ask this question a lot, but I am asking it specifically of you, of you because of the work you're doing and where this conversation's gone. The, obviously the world is wild right now and things are, there's a lot of really vivid, crazy symbology everywhere and everything's hyper. And if we view what we're considering reality a dream our waking lives a dream those are all cues always that the your personal unconscious is giving you to wake up within the dream and to get in into to get lucidity and and then what's the you know the point of lucidity is to become more aware and awake and in the moment yet you're dreaming you have a physical body that's sleeping and you have this awakening consciousness within consciousness that is blooming. So if we start overlaying that with the stuff that we're all collectively noticing now, I mean, who cannot, who can disagree with how crazy everything from the weather to politics to, I mean, just everything is so unusually wild that I'm wondering, what do you think's going on within this waking reality that we all share collectively? I mean, I, I think that's really interesting what you're saying, because when I talk to people about life after death and ghosts, um, when I, I always tell people, you know, um, when, when people say I'm afraid of dying, I always ask them why, and they say, well, because I'll be dead forever. And then I say, well, but you weren't alive forever. Like on the other side, right? Before you were born, you didn't exist forever. And then you were born for, you know, 70 or 80 years, hopefully. And then you die and then you're non-existent again forever. Um, I've always said, so like the way that we have waking and dreaming in this world, you're awake most of the time. And then you have these weird moments where you sleep and you have dream. And if you apply that analogy to existence and non-existence, the non-existent part is the waking and being in body is the dream. That's why there are so many weird things going on. That's why there are colors and shapes and sounds and animals and people and planets and stars, because this is more dreamlike than the other sides of it. Non-existence pre-birth and non-existence after life. You are more awake when you're in the non-existent form and i feel like things are chaotic right now because that consciousness that pervades everything the cosmos the sun and the stars uh the earth because i i do have a very panpsychic view of everything um i think that those things are trying to rattle us to shift this reality to not a horrific nightmare but it's, it's that moment in the dream for us when you're having a difficult dream or a, a nightmarish dream, when you can make the choice to either wake up and come back to this world, or you can take control of it. And I think that the larger consciousness that we are inside of is, is trying to get us not to not exist, 
but to get us to make sure that this isn't a, a night terror. And, and there's certainly elements of that, you know, glitting around. What do you... So in, in the end here with with this query, how do we reconcile? I, I st I'm stumbling here because I don't actually know how to ask this question. I can see it so clearly. What's the nature of the everyone else being sentient as well as us? I see everything completely connected. Yeah, like mycelium and you know i mean we, there's so many examples in nature it's all over and if you can't see that it you know i'm sorry look it, it's there everything's so interconnected yet there there seems there's this sense of is there is there a grand awakening collectively that actually can shift things so say in the model of something like 2012 in the mayan calendar or the the new age event that people are talking about or even it even if we put roll it back in the way back machine and and ponder the idea of a big bang or the way you know the birth of a sun a star uh is 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 it possible that we're on the precipice of something like that? I mean, I definitely think it's possible. I just think that the what seems to me to be problematic is my great awakening um, is every individual on this planet doing the work they need to do on themselves. And it very much seems like there are a great majority of people who, whether it be through our social constructs or our monetary systems, don't have the time or the ability or the want or the, the self-desire to do the work that they need to do on themselves. The fact that they have this concept, which to me seems ridiculous, of this kind of duality that there can only be a yes and a no that there can be no gray areas or, or, or endless color spectrums. The fact that people have difficulty grasping that the one thing that we have in common is that we're all different. And in our difference comes our commonality. It's the thing we share. It's the thing that is most special is that I am not like you and you are not like me. And how wonderful is that? And that's what we have to give to each other. Um, that's the great awakening, but it's work that has to be done by the individual. So hearing that, I, I'm, I can't help but think of in, in the collective right now, that meme of the NPC. How does all of that play into this? Do you even acknowledge that? What, you know, this, this idea that they're just background filler characters that that have those a are depth. different those are different from the npcs like the dolores well, cannon style background people well just okay yes so the filler filler that are just not so, real at soulless all soulless beings i think would be a proper term soulless beings are you know that they can wait awaken but that they're there's a depth they only go so far so no matter what you do what we do collectively, their program is shallow. Like I there's know. no there's no rendering further for it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly how I feel about that because at a certain base level, I feel like everyone shares the same amount of import as everyone else. And I don't feel like anybody is a NPC. Um, I just feel like part of my work is understanding that, is understanding that everyone has value um, and that I am unable to see it sometimes. Yeah, that's very Jungian. Like Jung really did believe everyone had was in possession of a soul and that it, you know, it was either sleeping or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of language and 
verbiage right. around that. That um, it's just interesting that that meme that you know in the real sense of the word meme and not right pictures with the uh, <laughs> that that meme is actually so heavily out there right now. I think it allows people to not do the work. I think that's one of those things that allows people to say like, oh, well, we don't have to worry about them. Uh, that person is background filler, right? Like, like that makes it very easy to do more, to do less work on yourself. Because uh, if you, you, you take that circle and make it smaller and kick people out of it, like it's a lot easier to deal with your smaller circle than, than with the all encompassing one. And that is not just on the human level too. I mean, that's the value of, you know, why I go outside and talk to the wind and hug trees and talk to dogs and whistle back to birds, like recognizing the value, not just in the human experience, but in the experience that everything is experiencing. So back to, and this is kind of my last, this is kind of the place I usually leave it before we go into other woo-woo or questions or whatever. And, and we've already touched on this. We, I think we did it midway through, really or early on, is the idea of death and uh, how that plays into the greater tapestry here. And, 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 and what you, since you've already died and, uh, you know, and I have had my, uh, I, since we both ponder with, whether we are <laughs> alive anyway, what, what do you think, what do you make up? Because it's still, it's still obviously in this, in this greater dream, it's still like that checkpoint in time that we all get to. And and then there's of course all of the the lyrics and songs and fodder for philosophy about little deaths and each time you go and to the dream state that's also a little death. What are your ideas, I guess, philosophically and also through your experiential stuff and ponders about death in and of itself? So when I talk to friends and, and people confront me in situations at lectures, I don't mean confronting in a, any kind of uh, actionable way. I just mean talking to me. Um, you know, people want to, for some reason, they think that I have an answer when they say, you know, do we continue to live on? And I don't have that answer. And I, I don't think that we're supposed to have that answer. I think that it's a, if there's ever been a, a, an archetype to drive us, it's death. And it's to make us ponder these questions and wonder why we're here and shape us and form us and give us, even in times of doubt, a reason to wake up and experience the sun and uh, tragedies even, how wonderful it is to be able to cry and to have a broken heart, uh, because there may be a time when I will never be able to cry again. There may be a time when I will never be able to experience tones of gray and shades of brown. Like these, these are the things that death brings to us, these beauties in the mundane, uh, the recognition that everything has worth and has beauty within it. And were we to know solidly that there was something else that, that we persisted in a manner understandable to us now, uh, what would be even the reason to be here now? You, you sum up, you're summing it up with basically the same thing as the great uh, Velveteen Rabbit when Skin Horse asks what it, what it is to be real, to be loved. And... Once you become real, you can't become unreal. Yes, and and you, you get there by being your ears falling off and being tattered. You're loved to death, essentially, and you're real then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so profound and beautiful. I always come back to it. I, uh, 
I, I know there's a ton of stuff I'd like to dive into as far as woo 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 that you deal in like ETs and <laughs> all of that. And, but we are at that, that time slot where we usually get into some of that and also post questions to the audience. Just to start out with though, what do, what do you, in your experiences now, especially since you do all the conferences and cons, you've written books on that. What are ETs? What's going Are You know, what are these, um, this, and we talked about this earlier, but I feel, I still feel like I wanted, I'm left with, I have question marks here around that. Sure. So I'm left with wanting more about that. Sure. So, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I think there are absolutely uh, extraterrestrial creatures. There are probably some that interact with us uh, on this planet in this seemingly shared reality. I think that there are also uh, creatures. I mean, obviously, the creatures that we encounter, whether they be fairy folk um, or extraterrestrials, uh, we place our own personal judgments and biases on them according to what we feel they are. Uh, in Michigan, you know, there are legends of dog man. And so when people see big, hairy things walking through the woods, they'll say it's a dog man. But if, you know, someone doesn't know the legend of the dog man and see the exact same thing, they call it Bigfoot. Uh, so you know, the reality of those creatures is, is sometimes shaped by, of course, our experience. And so I think, as I said kind of earlier, like my universe is open to all of them existing um, and all of them being somewhat misunderstood, which I kind of find fun and beautiful since so are we all. What? How can I phrase this without sounding like a lunatic? What? What percent? Okay. <laughs> How much did social engineering, do you think social engineering has played in what has manifested in, in these beings? Say like in the last hundred years. Um, in what sense do you mean? Was, are we being pushed in a direction to, so, okay, so we step back to these, these entities. I would say some of them are manifested or dr drawn in let's put it that way they're drawn into our reality right sure and i think it's it's an attraction based on like or want or fear or whatever there's some kind of energetics between the two it's my little theory but it, i i think that we kind of manifest if you want to call it manifesting we manifest these things because of popularity or whatever like dog man like it's slender man showed up finally you know, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. No, I think that there are, are a great many, you know, whether you want to call them tulpas and aggregores and mm -hmm. thought forms and whatever that are roaming around out there that were created by us. Um, but the ones that exist independent of us, uh, those are the ones that fascinate me the most. You know, when I first encountered uh, all of this strangeness, uh, when I first started reading everything that I could read, uh, and trying to tie folklore and, and archetypes and history into modern experiences with UFOs and cryptids and mm -hmm. uh, astral creatures. One of the things that always drove me crazy that I didn't see written about a lot was that. So, like right now, people are experiencing, like, um, you know, obviously the way that most people imagine extraterrestrials are grays, right? So, big mm -hmm. eyes and big mm -hmm. heads, some kind of hyper advanced being that has. Uh, toned everything down to its base minimum because that's the most efficient. Like that's what we're getting right now. And when you look at the same kind of encounters that people had, you know, a thousand years ago, we're talking about dwarves and elves and tiny little people with beards and funny shoes that are mm -hmm. running around, right? Mm -hmm. And and to me, back in the '90s when I encounter when I first encountered that, like I said, I don't see a lot of people writing about this. It seems to me as if they are moving backwards in time. So as we progress forward and become more advanced, it seems like as they interact with us, they're moving backwards in time and becoming less advanced. Does that make sense? Totally. And it's actually, it correlates with something that another guest of ours said. Oh, it was uh, Laird Scranton. Mm -hmm. that, it's a, that it's a seesaw back and forth, but not specifically about interaction with the other, but just uh, yeah yeah con just consciousness the yeah 
yeah, just the natural kind of progression seesaw of back and forth of, of their development and ours. And in some instances, influencing us. I mean, there's no doubt that there are uh, scientists out there right now and science fiction writers and journalists and, and people who have been shaped and formed by the legends and stories that they have uh, made decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Based on that. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's cool. I, I'm just curious. And this, I know I'm not asking for an answer to what your thoughts are on the, so with that, with all that said, um, is that being taken advantage of by, say, the media or I think so. I groups? think, yeah, I think so. I think that, um, and to what end, of course. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, if, uh, when I talk about people who don't want to do the work on themselves, you know, so really quickly to give you a, <laughs> we didn't even talk about this at all. So my first kind of real, I got paid job uh, when I was 16 or 17, I met, uh, I was going to all these metaphysical conventions and psychic fairs. I met a named Craig, who was a historian who specialized in political assassinations of the 1960s and 70s. So the real kind of first work I ever did was historical research into what is now conspiracy theory. And so when I think about the social manipulation of uh, extraterrestrials, elves and fairies, witchcraft, uh, it always seems very much to me that there is this control mechanism by people in power who don't want to do the work on themselves, but find it very easy to either play off the... Uh, the differences between us, uh, that there are evil aliens coming to take us, that they're going to attack the world and take us over, uh, that there are creatures in the night who will destroy us, that there are beasts out in the woods, that there are demons, uh, that there are evil jinn, you know, that there are, and it's always been a mechanism of control. And in this day and age, uh, the control isn't as necessary as it is the retention of wealth and cash. And so, the fear backed factor is kind of gone into keeping us tribal just as long as people keep consuming. Which is definitely not conducive with an alien invasion. Right. Or a nuclear war. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I don't think. Both of which are getting amped up right now in the sure. collect nuclear war and alien invasion totally unrolled in front of us. Yeah. And you know, uh, I used to do a lecture back in the, right, right before Y2K, uh, I used to do a lecture on doomsday and talk about the fact that, you know, in, in as we were leading up to Y2K, and I actually gave that lecture, you know, right before 2012 too, uh, a kind of revamped version. But, uh, you know, one of the things I would start off saying is that, you know, if you look at doomsday scenarios, um, by when I was giving that lecture in, in 97 and 98, at that time, I had already lived through 40 doomsday scenarios from different groups. Um, and I think the last time I, I did that lecture, I was up to about 70 uh, doomsday scenarios from different apocalyptic cults and whatever. And the thing that always was seemed very relevant to me was the fact that uh, people are obsessed with doomsday and the end of the world because ultimately it gives their life meaning to die when everything else dies. It, they're not going to miss anything. Uh, nothing else is going to happen. Uh, the world is gone. Everyone else is dead. So it doesn't matter. Uh, and so what many people perceive as a pointless death becomes very pivotal and uh, not so scary if everyone else is going to die when you die. And so this kind of idea of doomsday, uh, of apocalypse that, that falls and, and destroys all life on earth um i think it's people kind of have a want in there because it's an easy way to give meaning to your death right letting go seems to be the such a major key here in the in in any kind of process is letting go to attachments you had uh prior to whatever your next state is that right. just kind of screams to us, to me at least, that we've been here too long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny, right? Because, I mean, it doesn't seem, I mean, we had, 
I, I get, it's so funny when my friends talk about, um, uh, I sometimes will get down on science during my lectures just because so much of it has become dogmatic and it hasn't really become science, you know, <laughs> and having, having scientists stand up and, and say, oh, there's no such thing as ghosts and we know because no one's ever studied it. Like that's not science, right? right. Like science, like there's no such thing as UFOs, and we know because we've never studied UFOs. Like that just is not science. And so when I tell my friends like science isn't that great, they'll say like, oh, but you know, but it's microwaves and it cooks your food and it flies you to conventions. Like it is great. And I'm like, yeah, but it also like has loaded the oceans with plastic and has filled the air with toxins. And like you know, there's uh, you know the plastic has now moved past the blood brain barrier like it, it's also done really really terrible things like maybe we've just had a good run like and now we're done 12 years but, <laughs> yeah really i have this i want to share this with you i had this profound experience this last week and last it's been a year now and i mentioned this on air when it happened one of my very long-term friends, Pat, that seems like everyone I know is dying right now, but had died uh, it, last June, June 26th. And her name was Tammy. I hadn't seen her, her husband and her kids, you know, in many years. And uh, they, her husband's from the Pacific Northwest where I now live. And so they're visiting and and so the experience, you know, it was great to see them and the girls are getting so big. And of course they remind me of the mother, her name's Tammy. But I ha I fell into this, this kind of weird reflective state while hanging out with them. And we did what they always did, which we all like. We, we went out to like Dugan Falls and had nature experience, big nature experience. And, and so it was, uh, you know, when you're out in big nature, there's, it's real reflective and it's so easy to go inward. And we were all doing our own things. You know, Eric's fly fishing. The youngest daughter has got a high level of autism. So she's in her world doing her thing. And then the other daughter's down the river. And I, I just have this deep emotional experience of Tammy's life without her and it was very bittersweet you know because I've I've had I had a, a great amazing dream when she passed and I, so I knew she had passed it was just so big with the wind she was the wind and uh these experiences that let me know that whatever her consciousness is it still was it's still floating around and I certainly did while we were I had butterflies landing on me everywhere this, you know, this last week with when I was hanging out with them, but it was this deeply moving experience of, of uh, a person's life without them. And I know she didn't want to leave. Of course she didn't. I mean, she was like 50 years old and the girls are both young. And so I don't know. It, 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 it it something in it shifted for me with the process, and I have always been all right with death. Death and I are we are death. That we are life, and it, it something shifted. And and since the the days since then have kind of brought in a darker tone. Uh, and I'm not sure what it is. I can't pinpoint. It. I'm too new, too close to that experience of the reflective aspect of it. Uh, but I, I just feel like this is the right conversation to address, it, especially since it's coming on a year. It's like this idea of attachment, of life, of living, of big nature, uh, and how profound people are in our lives. And when they move on, what they what they leave behind, the good stuff. You know, this was this was just pure wonderful to see to see her babies and her husband and. And it felt lonely, and yet it didn't feel lonely. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. The whole thing felt like a dream. Absolutely, like just like like the dream where she passed. You know, and she became the wind. And it, it's it's it shook me up in a weird way, which is hard to do at this point in my life. I mean, but those. 
those shifts are necessary, right? Aren't they? I mean, they they seem to be, at least for me, like, so, you know, when I moved my parents in with me and my mom's going through her Alzheimer's and my father's kind of difficult to live with at this point, and uh, I took them up north, I took them back to their house for about a week just to let them see their flowers and be in their, their own space for a while. And, uh, you know, I'm, I tell everybody, you know, doing this with my parents, like I'm learning a new dance, right? Like I'm learning new movements and steps and sometimes I'll fall down and trip, but eventually like I'm going to learn the dance and I'll be good at it. Uh, but when we were up North and they were doing their thing and, and in their, in their space, like I just, uh, had this moment of where I, I, I walked way back in the acreage where there's nobody. And as I was walking, I just kind of instinctively like started taking off my clothes. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and by the time I got way back into this, uh, kind of field in the forest that's back there, like all of the construct of me had been stripped away and I was just standing back there, uh, just another part of everything. And it was all okay. Like, all of it, all of the suffering and all of the pain and all the people I missed and everything, it was, it was fine. Like it was absolutely fine. And then I snapped back into it and I was like, Oh shit, where, I don't even know where my underwear is at. You know what I mean? And I was like, I became human again, but there was that moment, that necessary moment of, of completely stripping all of my humanity away so that I could mm. become human. Yes. It's like the descent into the, an honest descent into the underworld or whatever myth you want to use. It's grounded. Yeah. 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 And it is initiatory. You know, I think that we do that throughout our lives. We have to have those experiences. We have to, you know, uh, desire light and see our corpse laying in a coffin uh, mm -hmm. to, to realize the, the, like I said earlier, kind of the, the, the beauty of everything, including, you know, the heart frame. Yes. I've always, I've always embraced the heartbreak and, and, and I value that in other, I love it. It's inspired my art and everything. I mean, I feel like, like in the velvet, velveteen rabbit. I mean, it's part of what really gives people character in, because we have a choice in how we process these things. We have a choice in how we engage in, in the process of heartache and the hardships in life and in that create depth of character which is something that you you can't money doesn't buy you that you know this is experiential this and, is and real in, you, in your experience with your friend you said that things have taken on a darker tone and is that do you feel that the the universe has taken on a darker tone or no it was it's it was completely my own hubris and and my missing her life for her and that i f i felt so as that thought was washing over me eric's fly fishing you know ginger's down the river stacking rocks or trying to find geodes something and and violets running around being violet and i had this uh, i'm having these thoughts and it had turned me you know i was been real happy but i had this moment and then this black moth comes and lands on my bangles and and it wouldn't and it just kept circling me and landing back on the bangles and I just felt like that was such a clear communication. First of all, that it was a black moth. And uh, I mean, you know, just I, I took this, I'm looking at the symbology here as it's happening and unfolding. And so the, the, the darkness of it is my own processing of attachment in life. And, and, and I've said like that it is her life without her. And there was something uh, that's triggering a projection for me of, you know, when, and this didn't happen for my mother and like other people, it's at a different level. Maybe it's that we, this perception of age, right, John, right. It, it's, it was just bittersweet and i walked into it with beauty and it's creating a lot of good art but, and i realized today that it, it's my own hubris and my own sadness 
for for her like i feel i feel bad for those girls and i, I you know i like i don't know i think i'm just projecting into it but it's i've never really had this experience before and i've lost a lot of people so it is on a different level and yet there she clearly was to me in this moth and and giving me these beautiful vibrations and and the everyone seems fine you know they've gone through a hard year and but then again as you mentioned the world outside right now is so hyper real and anything's and there's this feeling of anything's possible from like the worst worst of the worst to the best of the best and and as always we have a million choices there's 50 ways to leave a lover baby <laughs> well i'll tell you my my <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you my so i was in virginia last weekend at an event and it was the first uh, time I had gotten away from uh, being with my parents for a month solid. So it I was, uh, it take, took me a little while to relax. I started to relax once I got out of the state of Michigan. And then uh, I got to the hotel and immediately fell asleep in a, just a dreamless dead sleep. I didn't have to worry about anybody was going to wake up. Nobody needed water. Like I just got in the hotel room and passed out. And I woke up the next morning feeling very lively and refreshed. And I went outside to have a cigarette and I'm standing outside the hotel and I thought to myself, wow, it's, it's very like this kind of garbagey hotel parking lot. And it wasn't garbage, but I mean like, you know, lots of oil slicks and, and big pickup trucks and stuff. I was like, this, this parking lot is really beautiful. And as I thought that this giant monarch butterfly like flies past me and lands on a flower right next to me. And I was like, oh, perfect symbology, like showing me the beauty in the, in the kind of nonsense. And so I took out my phone uh, to, to get a picture of the butterfly, to, to give it permanence, to, uh, to make it real in the real world, this, this giant butterfly. And it immediately started flying away from my camera. So I, I was chasing it through the parking lot. And as I was chasing it, um, I got stung by a giant wasp. And I flicked it off the back. It stung me on my finger as I flicked it off the back of my neck. And I saw it hit, hit the ground and my finger was throbbing. And I immediately started laughing because I realized what the message was, right? Like, this is a moment. It's a beautiful moment. It's all it needs to be is a beautiful moment. That's all it was ever supposed to be. And you were really struggling to make it more than it was. And so I started laughing and I ended up taking a picture of the wasp and posting it on my social media and saying, you know, this guy tagged me today. And then uh, it, I became, I started this love affair with this wasp. Like I found, uh, you know, I, he flew away and I found the hornet's nest where the wasp nest where he was at. And I watched them for the rest of the weekend. And like, it, it became a whole separate dynamic. That's incredible. And what is so incredible is the contrast there. And, and, and this is what, that's that whole polarity thing. And what gives it all like depth and, you know, in yeah. painting, which is what I, I studied in college. Of course, I'm a, I'm a school dropout. Uh, is, you know, one of the very first ways to get something to pop is to get put the shadow in. Right. <laughs> it's like, all of a sudden, it's coming at you. You don't even need the chiaroscuro, the rounding of it. You start start throwing in shadows, and now you've got you've got contrast, and these things come at you. Yeah, it, that's incredible. I love, the butterfly and the wasp. That should be a Tom Waits song. <laughs> well, the, pic <laughs> the the picture of the wasp is on my Instagram. If anybody wants to go to my Instagram and see the wasp. <laughs> I'll follow you. I need to. I need to find you there. I just found you on Twitter yesterday when Jerry, because uh, he's runs an Oxmente page, put you know sent out the thing. So I followed you there. On that note, though, do, Jerry, do we have questions? I haven't seen any. Amazing. I mean, this has been a, a really intimate, thorough, uh, deep Lovely dive. Lovely and wonderful. Mm -hmm. I have I have no secrets. So it makes it easier to tell the truth and to remember what I've said. How about it, dude? How <laughs> fucking about it? <laughs> well, oh, it right. That's the way to be. <laughs> Thank I'll you. tell you what. It's it's so funny because my friends get scared because they know that I don't have any secrets, and I'll say you know whatever is in my my mind, and I tell them I said I I don't have any secrets that are mine. 
I have yours. <laughs> yes. Uh, yours are <laughs> yours are yours. Mine, uh, I don't have any, but mm-hmm. but I, you know, I so now they know they can confide in me because, I, you know, they know that loose lips aren't going to sink ships. Right. Not your secret to tell. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like I'm at one of the roles in my life has been a secret keeper for people, and not and I, you know, I am ask me and I will tell you most people don't want the answers that I'm going to give from what they think are hard questions because I'm going to give you the truth you may not want to hear it I've also discovered that because after I died uh, I didn't drink or or do any drugs from 18 until 31 Uh, and I realized that that period of time when I was developing who I was uh, was strengthening me to become all of my friends and family's storyteller. Uh, I'm the one who remembers everything from that period of time. When all of my friends were turning 21, 22, 23 and started experimenting with drugs and alcohol, I was the one who was there and completely sober. And so I've ended up being able to tell them their own stories. Oh, that's that's a gift too. That's wonderful. When So when you did start to play around, what did you play around with? Um, you mean with alcohol and drugs? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did drink and do, and I smoked pot and did acid, um, in my teenage years. And then, uh, I only drink alcohol now, uh, that started at 31. Uh, the only time I did any drugs in the nineties, uh, I was very big because of my death experience. I was very concentrated on figuring out how my mind worked. Mm-hmm. So like so like I took classes in neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis and I joined the Society for American Magicians and the International Brotherhood of Magicians and became a magician and then I started signing up at Wayne State University in Detroit for experiments in sleep deprivation and isolation tanks and then I think in 96 uh I went to Mexico and had an ayahuasca experiment uh, you know, uh, an actual experience with priests and everything like that, because uh, I wanted to see what my mind could do. But that's 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 the only time I did drugs, really, in the in the nineties. I think was that ayahuasca in Mexico. What did you think about that experience? Um, it was interesting. Uh, I I realized that for most people. Um, the experience is transformative and for me it didn't feel so much because my death experience was transformative to me right and this this felt less so it felt less so and i think because probably i had made a conscious choice to have that experience to where my first transformative experience was involuntary yeah involuntary interesting yeah, that's a, a good perspective to hear it from is we hear lots of stories about ayahuasca and, and other uh, DMT and sure. all that. And so, yeah, that's a, I like hearing that, that perspective. It's. Yeah. I mean, I, I have friends who have done it now, obviously, like there's a ton of people doing it now and they're all having these massive shifts in their consciousness and all that has ever really, um, All that's ever really shown me is that maybe they weren't shifting in a way they should have before they did the experience. Well, nothing will shift your consciousness like dying. (laughs) (laughs) But there are, you said it earlier, there are many little deaths. Indeed. And I still, I'm still questioning that, you know, I mean, I think we could be dead. We're all just processing. Yeah. (laughs) There's one thing you said earlier about, um, you were describing the nature of reality and you were, you said it was chaotic and things shifting around and moving to fulfill whatever needs based am I, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but do you remember that when you said that? Yeah. And all I, I started thinking about, well, what, what came to my mind was a DMT trip with the, with the, the jesters or whatever, who are whatever, you know, shifting things and that, that space where stuff is shifting around constantly, or at least that's what, stories come back as yeah i that that kind of jester right trickster joker archetype Mm -hmm. that exists that moves everything around um 
that's why even in my internal dialogue, like when I was saying it out loud to you guys about the universe, like playing, mm -hmm. like I, I feel like calling it a trickster or a joke, I feel like of course all of these things that we've been talking about and that you guys talk about all the time, you know, we're having these deep philosophical discussions and we're never doing really what philosophers do, which is start a conversation by all agreeing on what words mean. I think that our society basically lacks the vocabulary to even discuss these experiences. Because yes. when I hear trickster, it seems to have a mean nature to it. When I hear jokester, it seems to have a, a, a mean nature to it. When I say play a game, it has uh, the duality of winning and losing in it. I don't mean it really any of those things. I, I, I really do mean that the universe by its own nature loves to create and and that's what it's doing and there's no happiness or malice in it those are the things that we place upon it within ourselves right and in, to some degree it's reflected back at us absolutely absolutely yeah and i, I actually chose the word jesters on purpose to not give it a i i i, I felt that when you were doing that <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to assign a, a neutrality to, or an, uh, an alignment. <laughs> the right. chaotic neutral. Right. <laughs> but then any Mason in the house is going to think the royal order of jesters. There's always some sort of tie. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, but you see, I think that, uh, well, whatever. That's a whole other discussion. Anyway, I have one question, and then we can wrap it up, and I, we won't keep John much longer. Um, Oswald asked if you ever seen the Northern Lights in Michigan's upper in the UP, and what do you uh, think of the phenomena? Yeah, I love it. Um, spending time up there, I've I've always loved watching uh, the Northern Lights whenever I've had the opportunity to do it. Sometimes you can even, you know, from where I'm at, I'll, about 14 miles outside of Detroit, uh, you can drive for you know an hour and get to some places in the thumb where you can see them but they're beautiful and just one more expression of just how incredibly weird the universe is uh it, I, I mean in all of its shape and form right like it, i'm just utterly fascinated as i'm watching these glowing lights dance around the sky and i'm fascinated by that and then i have to come to the realization that beyond those dancing lights in the sky are an uncountable amount of other dancing lights uh, that used to be angels and now that we call them stars, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's so funny to me. Uh, I will tell you, j jump back. I will end with something from the beginning. Now that I'm talking about looking at space, uh, an early memory that I have, uh, from childhood is laying on my back, uh, up North, staring at the sky and looking at the stars as the kind of night sets in and, and watching more and more pop into view and at one point uh, i close my eyes and i imagine in the darkness with my eyes closed i imagine that uh, the sky is bright white because i can see every star that would be in the sky and i think to myself it's not night it's always bright white oh i love that mm -hmm. I love that. It's been a great pleasure, John. This has just been soul fulfilling tonight and synchronistically just where I needed to be when I needed to be here. Well, thank you. I've had, uh, it's my pleasure. I had a great time talking to you. Yeah, it was fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for listening and the people in chat. It was a great chat tonight. And I bet I bet it was Jer. My, I'm sending my love out to all of our core people. Uh, you know I love you, Suzanne, Darcy, Amanda. I mean, I could just keep going. I was hopping. There was like five or fifteen people. Anyway, blah blah blah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. And be sure to tune in next week. We have Chuan Ku, Chuan Ku. Sorry, from Witches and Wine. That's, oh, that'll be fun. She's very interesting. Great podcast. Uh, I'll have a link in the description. I have all of John's links in the show notes and description of the, this video. So that's all I got. Everyone have a good night. Sweet dreams. Yeah, always. <laughs>